Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Artificial Intelligence as Culture, a roundtable discussion on skills and perspectives, uh, hosted by Les Rencontres Interdisciplinaires Hexagram 2020, Edition Symbiotique. Uh, the title of this first edition of Exagram Interdisciplinary Summit refers to the neologism created by the Canadian uh, Beth Dempster, uh, which she invented as an alternative to urban planning analysis centered on the concept of autopoiesis. Uh, the symposium is conceived under this key concept of distribution and sharing, as elaborated further by Donna Haraway. Uh, the autonomous subject is a fiction, autonomy like agency elsewhere only exists by, with, and in sharing between multiple forces, materialities, processes, and entities, human and other than human. The central question of the symposium uh, is expressed as follows. Uh, how can the current context, including the pandemic happening in the era of said Anthropocene, allow for the experimentation of sharing of autonomy and agency? The organization of this symposium uh, is a pooling of interest between the organizers, publics, and participants. Uh, the digital platform proposes to go beyond dissemination by adopting participatory methods uh, produced jointly by Exagram Scientific Committee, the production team, participants, and publics. Uh, the platform is a full-fledged research creation project. The objective is to reflect collectively on the sharing of autonomy in action, to practice the sharing of autonomy and of agency, social solidarity and research in action. Uh, today, we have the pleasure to discuss with members of the Machine Agencies Research, research Group uh, at Milieu Institute, uh, Bart Simon, Christopher Salter, Fenwick McKelvey, uh, Orit uh, Alpern, and Sofiane Audry. Uh, they'll discuss how algorithms are not only acting in culture, but rather constitute and produce culture. In other words, how they are part of broad patterns of meaning and practice that can be engaged empirically. Uh, but before we start, let me briefly introduce uh, our guest. Uh, Bart Simon is director of Media Institute and associate professor uh, in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Uh, his areas of expertise include game studies, science and technology studies, and cultural sociology. Uh, his research crosses a variety of genres and platforms looking at the relation of game cultures, uh, social materiality and everyday life. Christopher Salter is an artist, professor of computation arts uh, in the Department of Design and Computation Arts, co-director co of Exagram, and also associate director of Milieu Institute. Um, Chris' installation, environment and research focuses on and challenges human perception, merging haptic, visual, acoustic and other sensory phenomena. Fenwick McKelvey is a professor in information and communication technology policy in the Department of Communication Studies at Concordia University. Uh, amidst discussion of the Internet of Things, uh, McKelvey studies the Internet as things, investigating the machines, bots, artificial intelligence, and algorithms that make up the Internet's infrastructure. His ongoing studies have focused on new software and social media platforms that mediate political engagement uh, and the algorithms and AIs that govern the discover discoverability of, of online content. Uh, Arvid Alpern is a strategic hire uh, in interactive design and theory and a prof in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Concordia University. Her work bridges the histories of science, computing, and cybernetics with design and art practice. Uh, her work explored the genealogy of interactivity and our contemporary obsessions with big data. Current research uh, addresses history and theory of smartness, environment, and ubiquitous computing, and examines the forms uh, of planetary futures being produced and destroyed through high technology, large-scale large infrastructure projects. Uh, and finally, uh, Sofia Noudry is an artist, scholar, professor uh, of interactive media within the School of Media at University of Quebec in Montreal. Uh, his work is inspired from visual art, artificial intelligence, artificial life, biology, and cognitive sciences. His computational artistic practice branches through multiple media, including robotics, interactive installations, immersive environments, physical computing interventions, internet art, and electronic literature. Uh, Bart, your turn. <laughs> 
Terrific. Thanks, Alice. Uh, perfect introductions. So welcome, everybody. Thanks uh, to uh, participants here today, the, the group of us for showing up on a Friday. Um, we're reading uh, the entire experiment of this platform, the Sympoetique, as a, a kind of way to try to do things that we might have done otherwise, should we ever have a chance uh, to get together physically. Uh, so uh, we're all part of a, a broad group, which we call the Machine Agencies Research Group, uh, along with many students, who uh, many of whom I hope are, are tuning in now. Um, and we don't have enough occasions to just uh, get together and talk about the different threads uh, that we all are involved with. And so we're going to use this opportunity uh, to do just that. Um, each of us uh, has different threads leading through this question of AI as culture, and the idea is to uh, open that up and uh, almost, if you like, shoot the shit a little bit around the topic uh, and see where it leads us, because this is what we'd normally do in a research group meeting. Uh, so my plan for today uh, is to have us talk uh, about an hour, uh, and we'll start with kind of each of us sort of introducing our research areas as it pertains to the central uh, topic at hand. Uh, you can you can be as brief uh, as as you possibly can with the idea of putting some stuff on the table that any one of us can then pick up a, a, and pursue uh, in a kind of expanded question discussion. Uh, we go for about uh, 45 minutes to an hour as as we. We feel it's interesting and then my plan is to break the youtube broadcast model and instead uh, we'll throw out the zoom link to everybody and anybody who wants uh to jump in and open up a discussion for the second hour and people who don't have to stay people can come and go but it we are if you like emulating our process uh, of the research group a degree of formality and a lot of informality uh, and hopefully a lot of fun uh, and some interesting ideas that come out of it uh, so with that in mind, we can get going. I, I guess I'll I'll sort of direct. It will go, uh, you know, uh, let's say Fenwick, Sophie, and Orit, uh, Chris, and myself in that order as a kind of introduce yourself and sort of the the, the not all the research, but the threads that you think you'd like to put on the table today. Fen. Yeah. So thanks. Um... It's, yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to this. You know, there's been a bunch happening, and I think you can kind of summarize. I think the, the the three threads here is that one. I think through machine agencies, we've been having a really interesting conversation about, um, you know, what is the nature of uh, well agency and trying to think through the ways and formats of kind of imagining and, and rethinking kind of human machine relations. And I, I've been doing a lot of work and this builds on a, a book of mine called Internet Demons, which I think was an attempt uh, at least to think about the internet itself as this kind of amalgam of humans and machines creating, creating this uh, assemblage of communication. Um, and that kind of continues forward in some of the work on machine agencies uh, what the other part, and I think one of the things that I'm happy to hijack this conversation about is that uh, this has kind of bled over into trying to think about how different approaches of AI and culture have an importance and impact and kind of the policy debates that are happening right now around AI governance and particularly privacy reform. We've just had a new privacy act put tabled uh, two weeks ago or last week in, in, in parliament. And so, you know, I'm really you know, struck by and challenged with how do we how do we translate this knowledge that we have in academia, which I think radically undermines and questions, you know, the boundaries that I think are that are unquestioned in a lot of the kind of more instrumental policy making that we have. And um, that's another thread that I'd like to talk about. And I could talk, discuss in particular some of some of what we've been following uh, in, in the recent kind of policy updates. And the third is that I'm on, I'm on sabbatical right now. And so I've been really in deep space working on the history of computers and politics. And so this is something uh, we've a lot to talk about with the Reed Halpern, um, whose book I would add, you know, is kind of influential on this whole matter. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to think about what's the kind of long history of how, how the, the, the turn towards computational models to think about voters and politics really kind of prefigures this idea that we can have an artificial intelligence in politics in the first place. And so this, I think, really is, is probably the most direct part of the panel to me is that the, you know, this is something that I think is, you know, a 50 or 60 year history, really, which has been about the investments in data and datafication 
and the idea of kind of computational models of the human, which has really prefigured this idea that artificial intelligence can even be innovative. And, you know, that I think is a really exciting history and there's work there, but there's so much to be done that um, I'm really excited also about talking about how, you know, media history approaches are an important part of kind of unpacking this AI as culture. Great, Sofian. Hi. Um, so um, yeah, um, thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really really happy to uh, to be here with you. I wish we we be there in person, of course, but uh, apparently that might happen soon. <laughs> so I've heard. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm Sofian Audrey, uh, and I. Uh, uh, my my research uh, interests uh, are. Um, uh, around the practices and aesthetics of uh, uh, AI-enabled art or enabled uh, AI-enabled crea creation, um, more broadly, uh, and uh, I'm currently uh, actually uh, the, the 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 news just came last week, uh, so uh, about uh, my book. So I'm I I have a a book that's upcoming uh, next year uh, on machine learning machine learning and art. And, uh, and in that book, I, I explore these questions of uh, practice. Uh, how, how do artists have uh, historically and, and currently uh, been using uh, machine learning systems? Uh, and uh, one of the things that is, is uh, that particularly interests me is uh, uh, how artists have uh, uh, not only been using these technologies, but how 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 artists can also uh, change and have changed the way that AI is being uh, done and implemented. And uh, to me, one of the so one of the the, the 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 one of the main reasons why I'm interested in this is that uh, I from uh, and. From, from the research I've done myself and through uh, uh, research done with uh, artists who are using these, uh, these systems, uh, one of the things that comes, comes out is that uh, uh, artists have uh, a, uh, a knack to uh, approach, the, they approach these systems through a very um, material approach, so they 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 they're able to sort of um, uh, take these systems in their own uh, in their the, the way that they're that they're designed and 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 change like a, a experiment with uh, uh, with their with their their. Um, their affordances and their materiality, and in so doing, uh, they they come to reveal uh, their uh, their the way that these systems can and do operate uh, in changing, transforming cultures and transforming uh, politics and economics, uh, but through a very sort of material 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 approach, and. Um, so uh, and just to to give an sort of an example or a, a sense of, of of that, the the book uh, I I'm I'm working on uh, is uh, actually split in different parts that represent the different parts uh, that compose a machine learning system. So uh, and and in each section we look at uh, I look at how some artists specifically, for example, will work uh, by uh, working on the side of the data, which is one aspect of uh, working with machine learning systems. So by either uh, collecting their own data uh, or uh, outsourcing uh, the data or, or mixing data sets, other artists will approach uh, working on the modal side of machine learning systems. So they'll, they'll work more on uh, changing things inside a neural network, for example, or on using different kinds of approaches uh, because there's not just like neural nets uh, that can be used. And finally, uh, there is a rich history also of uh, artists working on the side of the learning process itself. 
So all the question of uh, how these systems are designed for optimization, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive uh, for art because art is sort of by definition non-optimizable. There's no such thing as like the best song or the best movie or, uh, and it's not because you take two of your favorite movies and mix them that's gonna do something good. So it's like, it's not the same kind of uh, problem that these systems have been designed for. And, uh, and so artists have been using different sort of strategies to um, hijack these systems and, and, and produce uh, either interesting effects or, uh, or uh, self like met meta reflective works uh, using these systems. So, so I'm excited about our discussions today. Super cool. Okay, Marit. Yeah, hi. So um, I'm super excited for this conversation too, and thanks for having me. Uh, so my work obviously uh, intersects with a lot of other people. So um, I'm a history historian of science, and mostly I do histories of cybernetics design in the human sciences. I work a lot on situating and contesting such concepts as smartness and historicizing ideas of intelligence. Um, more broadly, of course, out than out just outside uh, the the frame of what we usually conventionally call AI. So really important to me. It's also to think about artificial intelligence as an epistemology, as like an approach or a way of seeing the world, and not just a technology. So um, so I work a lot on things like smart cities, and I also work a lot historically on uh, themes that intersect with Phoenix. Work, really great work, um, Narita's Demons book, uh, which is inspirational to me as well about thinking about uh, the relationship between uh, technology, aesthetics, design, and governmentality and politics. Particularly, I've been interested in looking at how histories of things like race relations and race warfare in the United States have kind of fed into or been the infrastructure for um, and have been dealt for through new strategies and design and data collection throughout the second half of the 20th century to turn political problems into problems of personalization and interactivity uh, and a demand for ubiquitous computing that kind of underpins our current kind of fetish for smart infrastructures and uh, computational solutions to uh, political, environmental, and security problems. Uh, one of the things that really interests me, therefore, is um, both how we're imagining and envisioning the future of these technologies and particularly, um, and also uh, older terms such as politics, the demos, and agency. And particularly, I've been really interested in thinking about um, uh, AI, again, like what it offers us, how these different approaches to repeat Phoenix argument uh, impact how we're envisioning and designing the future of um, computational infrastructures and particularly I've been trying to think also beyond uh, training sets about thinking about the way biases are structured through what are we measuring how are we to what how we're um, measuring things like um, efficiency optimization the goals of our systems uh, sort of broader infrastructural questions that actually shape systems biases outside of perhaps just um, certain loci that we've already focused on, not to take away from that, that's really important to me, but I'm really looking to kind of broaden the question of how bias, racism, sexism, other kind of forms of discriminatory inequitous um, uh, problems are kind of engineered into systems at, uh, at, at multiple scales and locations, speaking to the scale question of this um, uh, discussion. So I'll kind of, and to think about that right now, I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between economics and ecology, actually, and the kind of history of um, how we've reformulated ideas of environment, but also uh, economy and the economic agent and uh, in order to do that. So. Um, I'll end there. A couple questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, finish us off and then we can get go. Oh, no, and then I will, but then you can go. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bart uh, and everybody, uh, all my colleagues. I'm, I'm a far away in Berlin, uh, but I feel so much closer now. Um, so um, I'm interested as an artist, but also as a researcher in the 
let's say the question about the liveliness and the entangling of different types of agencies between humans, machines, and environments. Um, so in that way, many of us have very similar interests, but we all approach them from very different uh, disciplinary, but even interdisciplinary uh, perspectives. Um, as an artist, uh, Sophie and I have worked with, been working together actually for a long time, since 2010 on artistic projects uh, that use um, machine learning to, uh, let's say, generate behaviors in systems as opposed to analyze existing behaviors. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite interested in the, the, the different types of temporalities that emerge from um, machine generated actions um, and how those affect um, perception, human perception. Uh, I'm finishing a book now of, uh, called Sensing Machines on the Kinds of Material Imaginaries, um, i.e. imaginaries that actually got them somehow realized in 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 objects in 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 in, in bodies and environments, uh, but looking at how artists and designers and 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 scientists uh, have have had this long interest in creating these complex relationships between human and machine notions of sensing uh, that go way beyond this idea that you know Google invented data surveillance uh, and then that's what sensed environments are about. Um, but I wanted to throw out to all my colleagues and also to the to the audience a, a larger question, which is something I've been thinking a lot about, based on a new hype hype thing that just came out, which many of you know about, um, which is of course the GPT three uh, Open AI language generating system. And the question is, um, can we have uh, a, uh, can we have AGI uh, artificial general intelligence without having a body? Um, and I just wanted to read something uh, to, to you and then leave it at that. At that. Um, so Sophie and I uh, participated uh, last year in a, in a big show uh, exhibition at the Barbican Center called AI More Than Human, um, which uh, brings up more questions than it answers. Uh, that show's on tour right now. Um, we've created a work for that. I just wanted to read you, and I think this is very, very interesting. Um, I want to read you just a paragraph, uh, half a par two paragraphs, from a, um, a review of the show that was in the STS journal Science as Culture um, by a uh, London-based writer uh, named Deborah Benita Shaw, who was in uh, art and design uh, at uh, the University of East London. And here it goes. This is the beginning, quote, the problem with subtitling, subtitling an exhibition uh, more than human, it seems to me is that the more than to make sense, you have to have some idea what you mean by human in the first place. Although we could probably accept that there is a broad agreement that a machine could outperform a typical person in one or more capacity might be said to function beyond human limits. To be strictly pedantic, you would need to specify that the human referred to is both typical and unaugmented. It is here that we would run headlong into the problem of identifying both the limits of typicality and the line that separates putative human beings from the devices on which their existence depends. Strictly speaking, a typical human is always already a ma manipulator of technology. One of the founding ideas of the contemporary post-human turn is that the human is the animal that must of necessity create the environment in which it thrives and thus can be said to only thrive as a result of its coextension with technical devices. Put another way, there is no human that exists apart from the technology which provides for its continual existence. And this is of course a long-term theme that many, many researchers, philosophers, cognitive science have talked about a long time, extended mind, extended body, uh, distributed cognition and so on. Okay, um, the linkage, this linkage is important because AI more than human reinforces one of the myths of artificial intelligence, namely that such a development will finally lead to the birth of autonomous thinking machines capable of both cognition and self-recognition. This may well come to pass, but in, the case, in that case, we would be faced with what Werner Vinge has famously called the singularity, which would usher in a species more accurately described as other than human. Admittedly, this brochure, the brochure accompanying the exhibition goes some way to acknowledging this when it admits that the boundary between ourselves and technology is becoming harder to see and that it may, quote, lead us toward new forms of life, unquote. 
However, the exhibition in general tends to take for granted a common view about what the terms human and artificial intelligence actually describe. As long ago as 1987, the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard posed the question, quote, can thought go on without a body, unquote. His answer was a qualified no, because thought necessarily operates within the context of an encounter between the body and the world. So what's very interesting now is with all of the hype that's just emerged in the last month about the new uh, text generating GPT-3 system, which has 175 billion parameters that can write poetry. Here's one thing says it can write original, coherent, and sometimes factual prose and not just prose. It can write poetry, dialogue, memes, computer code, and who knows what else. Um, it, there's this discussion about this, you know, now we're reaching a point where this may be the beginning of this notion of artificial general intelligence. And so my question is, can you even have language? Can you have a language generating system that essentially is only reading text but has actually no corporal relationship uh, to the world? And that's what I just want to put out there. Uh, bomb after bomb after bomb, lots, lots to talk about. Uh, oh, we can start talking. I guess I should talk about me just a little bit. So, um, uh, I mean, this is just a great group. I mean, I have intersections uh, on so many threads with, uh, with people here. Uh, my own approach uh, stems almost directly from a, a very conservative kind of notion of, of sociology, which starts at the fundamental unit of human interaction is humans talking to one another. Um, and, and that we build our, our, our social concepts uh, by looking at two people in interaction with one another, minimal two, three, uh, and groups specifically. And so I start from the very simple premise, what happens uh, if it's not a human in that interaction? What happens uh, if it's uh, a machine, if it's a thing, and even more so what happens uh, if it's if it's a, it begins to be a kind of machine that is granted uh, the kind of autonomy and smartness and politics and agency uh, that our culture seems to want to tend to afford to, uh, to something like AI and machine learning. Uh, so if the sites of the constitution of society of, of all of our social categories are informed by those interactions, how will that fundamentally change social science? Uh, and so my unit of analysis typically as an ethnographer is, is encounters, so the sites at which humans encounter machines uh, and encounter machine agencies in various ways and forms and uh, how uh, that mutual relationship is co-constituted uh, through that interaction. And my game studies had is to be particularly interested in uh, the historical and present context of, of play and games for orchestrating those kind of encounters. So the ways in which uh, play, playful interactions and game inter interactions provide opportunities for imagining uh, both uh, futures and presence with with kinds of others, whether they be machine others or human others, uh, in both positive and negative or progressive and retrograde sorts of way, reproductive sorts of ways. So play becomes a kind of special category of encounter uh, for pursuing and exploring these things. And it's often, for instance, in the context of play and games where uh, I meet Sofian and Chris talking about uh, AI artworks. Um, and it's also where the domain of encounters where we can talk about, you know, the performance or the inaction of the computability of humans for machines, the kind of thing that we gets into and Fenwick gets into. Uh, so the, uh, again, if, if I, I take it as a site of analysis, this is my main focus for this. Uh, that's where I come into things. So that's us. <sighs> How do you want to do this, folks? I, I, I have agenda items. Other people, there have been drops. We have noticing in our uh, Zoom chat sort of dropping items. I, I would say anybody could pick it up. If nobody wants to pick anything up, I will press us on, on an issue. So you could pick up Chris's point. Uh, Fenwick was wanting to pop in on optimization when Sofian was talking at one point. Uh, how would you like to go? It, it, you got to unmute and jump in. I'm not going to like take hands. We wouldn't do that in a regular meeting, so. Processing. Uh, 
want to take on uh, the issue that's bugging me because we we uh, are constantly as a group of researchers that are not on the inside of research agendas with respect to the creation of AI technologies, yet we're always insisting that uh, we need to be heard or at least accounted for. Uh, could we take on collectively the question of the difference between uh, the cultural production of AI through our particular perspectives versus the notion that AI is a technology that is received by culture downstream, and that's all that we can deal with. Uh, so whether it be this new system that Chris is talking about, what's done is done. Now all we're left to study is its impact, what's called the social impact or cultural impact of technology. And that's, as researchers, all that we're left doing. I know we all disagree with that point, but I wonder if we can articulate that in a way uh, that is stronger than ever before because there's, there's such a cause to push the agenda uh, and our approaches into the heart of uh, what uh, AI research is about. Or do you want to leave it to the scientists and the engineers to do? And we'll just deal with the consequences. Uh, if I may, I um, something that I think is a uh, difficult, it's a very challenging with that question is that uh, artificial intelligence is a term that uh, uh, is so uh, polysemic. I mean, uh, I had a conversation recently with uh, one of my peers uh, and he uh, kind of suggested that uh, we needed to hire someone in my department that uh, was uh, able to, you know, that was an AI scholar. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, you know, I, we already have one. <laughs> and uh, it became clear to me that, you know, we just didn't see uh, AI as being, uh, when I think about AI, I think about something very different than what other people might think. Um, so, uh, and I think this is, this is uh, very, very challenging because what it means is that, for example, uh, if as, uh, you know, uh, as artists or as uh, uh, humanities scholar, we come up with new approaches uh, to do AI, to make AI, uh, new technologies, they might not be recognized as being AI by uh, computer engineers and, and so and so. Um, so I think this is uh, this is uh, yeah it, it's 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 challenging. That's one of the big reasons why I think this is this is challenging. And I mean, we've seen that you know I I, I see that uh, all the time when I and and sometimes even me I, I look at what some artists for example say oh well I'm creating this AI work and I'm like no this is not AI this is just computer science or this is just uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, reactive robotics. Um, and so, um, so I think there's a lot of uh, confusion. I'm not even talking here about, you know, the, the public perception of what artificial intelligence uh, is or means. So just, just does that mean we're calling on a uh, on definitions here or is that uh, is that that's a red herring? Well, I can right? that, that always thing. comes up in these discussions, right? <laughs> What yeah, do you mean? Uh, what, you know, what's your definition of AI? As if yeah. that that would, if we could solve that, we would answer all of these questions. But mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that's the case, right? Yeah, no, it, absolutely. But I can give a few definitions that I've. Uh, so, so to me, AI is is a is actually this very broad uh, field of research that. Uh, so, so I think, uh, and and it has historical. Um, um, roots and ramifications. So for me, I mean like good old fashioned AI, uh, chess playing uh, through, uh, through uh, death, death first <laughs> search uh, processes e is part of AI. Uh, but if you talk to uh, someone who's involved in deep, deep learning, for example, they'll just tell you that, no, this is just computer science. So there's this notion that AI is, so this is another definition of AI, which is AI is this moving target. AI is basically- Could, could I call out on Orit? 
Because yeah. Ari, Ari was talking about AI as epistemology and not as technology, and this is crucial, yeah. right? To, to, I just maybe Ari could elaborate because. I mean, for me, I think one of the, there's both a reflexive process for us rethinking our methods and our objects. And I think then there's also a public engagement question, which has to maybe expand our notions of where we think the political and regulatory policies or have, have you have to be acting. And I think both of those might reformulate these kind of simplistic separation. So one of the first things is, you know, um, if you open up history, if you're thinking about artificial intelligence and you expand it into um, broader studies like Fennec does of sort of um, political decision making and how we're modeling politics or how we're modeling an economic, like I tend to wonder about where we're citing and why we privilege certain technologies. So everyone likes deep learning, right? That's like supposedly, but it's not really used everywhere, <laughs> you know, uh, many, many systems. And when you start thinking about, uh, and when you start looking at logistical systems or supply chain manufacturing or financial in infrastructures and algorithms, you start getting a much broader conception of um, where some of these things are acting. And also I think modalities by which we may start thinking about them outside of just one specific technology. So, I mean, I think, and I think there's also an aesthetic question coming maybe back to Chris's issue, which is also, we ourselves have an aesthetics around AI. We have certain things we consider to be really um, studying AI and even artistically reperforming it. And we tend to heavily emphasize things like, um, computational technologies and the use of, again, nets and, and things like that. And we tend to not be examining other um, locations, if we will, where we're producing infrastructures for ideas of intelligence, but also broad, more broadly, like maybe we need to create new vocabularies or even think politically about what we need to intervene in. So for example, um, we've talked about optimization kind of at the behind this, but there's a politics optimization, right? What in any system, what are you thinking or optimizing? How do we rethink ideas of um, extraction, efficiency, optimization, all these terms that actually guide the application of technology at a, at a meta level. And they're always social and technical and epistemological together. I think like maybe we need to be looking at that um, rather than starting the question through technology. I think one of the questions is how we're framing the problem. Like, is the question about artificial intelligence or is the question about neoliberal extraction? Or, you know, how we're getting, how we're getting um, you know, uh, resources or money or energy or how we're, you know, how we're ma maintaining inequity, right? So would that shift the conversation? For me, yes. Like for me, the question, for example, in smart cities, it's like, what if we think about this? Is it, do I start from the technological infrastructure that we call smart, usually like lots of sensors and big data analytics and stuff like that? Or or do I start from a question of like, what are the series of supposed problems that these cities are supposed to be answering to climate change, racial inequity, and how are they maintaining them? And those have longer histories, they're broader, and they might not even be at all about what we would conventionally call computing. And so I'm really interested in kind of changing the types of questions we're asking and maybe not even starting with this problem of artificiality, which is just Chris's problem and his thing like if you're already framing things as a question about like embodied versus not or specifically um uh you know if we're already creating these certain dialectics and setting up the problem that way we're not going to be able to push out of thinking separately between technology and society so jump in Finn. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of stuff I'm just riffing off of, and that's really fascinating. Like, and I think that you know, the and I never can ever answer one question. I always have to have like three points, but it drives me crazy. But you know, I, I think it's like firstly fascinating to talk about the epistemology and to talk about specifically, you know, neoliberalism and economic theory and how much if we're talking about a critique of AI, it's really in the beginning of the 1950s that you start seeing this idea that you can use an economic model to understand and describe human behavior, I think is a really important specific breakdown 
of when we can talk about the beginnings of artificial intelligence. Because then, and this is where I'm tracing this into political science, where all of a sudden you are like, well, the decision for someone to vote or not is a matter of voter calculus. And they, de- they do this little weighting and ratio. And that's the way that we actually now today have uh, voter forecasting models. And so like how deeply embedded certain, you know, approaches to kind of, you know, to, you know, epistemologies that also, you know, have implications for what the human means, right? And that the fact that the human becomes this rational agent, you know, I think that's one step. Um, I think the second thing to say is that, you know, if we're talking about this, you know, splitting hairs about artificial intelligence, one thread that I think is really interesting here, and I really like about the machine agencies group is pushing at this kind of boundedness of computing, right? And that's what I think much of my frustration is people are like, oh, you know what we need to do? We need to find this algorithm. I'll take it out of the box, I'll open it up, I'll put some, shed some light on it, you know, we'll like, uh, you know, and, and, and it's all to say is the effect of like, I think these are, these are entanglements. And I think part of our work here is like drawing that out. And that's where I see some of the work in new materialism and some of Reed's work and Chris's work where, you know, what is our project in terms of thinking about the, the, you know, the artificial intelligence is, you know, something that is a kind of network through society and culture and how do we draw and expose that? I think that that's where the scholarly work and where I think some of the opportunities are for research creation. The last point I'll say, and this is the thing that's just my like a bit of uh, you know, frustration today is I'm watching all this reaction to artificial intelligence and how largely legal and instrumental it is. And these are major reforms. Like we're having a new privacy act here and it's going to, you know, it's, it, yeah, and it doesn't really address these questions of like data and optimization that I actually feel like here's where we make this intersection, where we actually create and understand the problems that it, as they are. And, you know, you can create, I think we have this potential of creating a split between what is, you know, the regulatory history of like we deal with privacy problems versus I think, you know, this very specific problem of optimization. And as a democratic society, how do we address that? I mean, you know, I think that that's actually a really crucial question. I've tried to push in my own scholarly interventions, but I, you know, I think that, you know, that's where we have this kind of importance. I think that's partially also where, you know, this, this kind of analytical impact has a significance is when we can actually really define the problems as they are, rather than what people have understood them to be. Do you want to think? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to respond, Bart, to the opening question about kind of the, the cultural positioning of AI. I mean, for me, like from a historical point of view, and this touches on Ori's argument about epistemology, you know, in, in the 1950s when AI became, it was a research program. So that's already a cultural question. This is not like some given thing out of nature that falls from the sky. You know, it's like, and the position you take is the, the, if you, there, there, are, there are so many different schools of AI and those are ontological positions about what kind of world you think the world is or would like, or you would like it to be. So if you think of symbolic AI, if you take connectionist AI, if you take inactive AI, those are three completely maybe incommensurable visions of basically how you understand human beings in relationship to the political, social, economic, a world, you know, and um, people just assume that they're just, these are given, you know. So by choosing a certain set of techniques uh, or positions, you've already established a certain worldview that you, you're, you know, that you're carrying forth. Um, and, and it's, as I totally agree with Orit, is that like everyone starts from the technology, but the technology itself is, is also a culturally embedded question. It emerges out of infrastructures, research labs, certain things are funded, certain things aren't. Why, for instance, it's so everyone so gaga about deep learning in Canada? Well, maybe it's because it was the, the thing that was funded while all the other AI was you know, going through the AI winters in the UK and the US. So it has a certain historical uh, legacy. Um, but I'm, I'm much more interested in, in like what c- these types of ontological worldviews that people subscribe to when they take a position around a specific kind of, uh, f- uh, you know, model or framework, um, not, not about what algorithm works or what algorithm does. That's like way, way lower level. Um, the higher level question is much more interesting because you start to construct a certain 
version of the world the minute you take a certain position about how you see um, a set of social technical processes of which artificial intelligence is one of many. Right? Well, but can we, so can we kind of take that point and the other points and push it a little more? Let's just say then, I'll push it all the way to Orit's extreme, right? It's, the question is not about AI at all, but it's about a culture that is committed to, the, to optimization. Um, and it, it's, it, it happened before AI, what we know is deep learning even appeared. Uh, and it may be that that commitment, that cultural commitment pre-exists deep learning, which uh, contributes to its ascendancy. So it's less about the fact that it got funding and more about an alignment between a kind of cultural predisposition towards something that we might call uh, optimization. Um, but then that begs the question. So we would need to actually focus more on what is this thing optimization? Maybe ask the question uh, whether optimization automatically belongs to a neoliberal agenda. Therefore, is all optimization uh, to be resisted and to be challenged and to be undermined or deconstructed? Uh, or, or are we trying to specify that a bit more in terms of, uh, for instance, working uh, more closely with with people developing the technology to rethink uh, their commitments around uh, what these technologies are meant to be doing, um, right? Which is how I understand some some not all artistic interventions on on this score, right? Uh, at the very least, we can ask questions about what non-optimizing AI is, right? That's why I always like to bug Sophian about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all, right, all right. I mean, I, I, I would, I would also want to say that optimization is one term that clearly figures heavily. But I would say things like self-organization, the history of decision making, uh, like how yeah. we're actually configuring the idea of agent, um, uh, all those also play in. But I think that. Um, your provocation is is a really strong one, um, but also I think we have a provocation about acting, yeah, and also asking about diversity in terms of not only, of course, people, um, and uh, but also in terms of uh, trying to think about that relationship between optimization and diversity and difference because the two don't seem commensurable actually. Um, and also um, to be thinking about other frameworks of what you might be trying to achieve. So I've been looking, for example, a lot at the relationship between the term resilience and the term optimization, both highly in use right now. And from ecological perspectives, resilient systems can't be fully optimized because then they couldn't evolve. And this is like a long running learning problem. And so for me, a lot of it is trying to ask people uh, historically, but also hopefully eventually in engineering and to, to begin to confront uh, ideas of how they're modeling their system and how they're understanding fundamental terms like evolution and learning and adaptation. Because those are also critical questions in terms of how we're, we're managing population through these technologies. So, uh, and I think when we reframe those, and I think that's what, that, that that's a job for, for art for social science for everyone is to kind of begin to explode the very model of systems. But maybe that also in a, in a less complicated or convoluted way could also be a policy question. I mean, I think one of the things that keeps coming up in policy and ethics is where we're citing regulatory intervention and also what kind of conditions of possibility we're producing, whether it's through public funding or through um, other actions for uh, for the future development, not only of technology, but yeah, of the technology. And obviously um, there's been heavy privileging of certain types of approaches over others, but also very often there's real questions about um, where we're citing regulatory or ethical concern. And that's a common ethics uh, issue. Like, is it always that really clear cut decision moment in the trolley problem or is it, you know, at another scale. And, I, and we kept mentioning scale. That's not something I have a great answer to, but it is one that I'm interested in, inter in kind of interrogating about like what it means to uh, move. Oh, I see Fennec, so maybe he could, he has something great. 
No, no, I just want to jump in. I mean, I also think that's part of why some of the, like, I think your questions about race and kind of optimization. I mean, I think one of the things that's so unsettling is looking at how old so many of the propositions we're actually dealing with in terms of artificial intelligence. I mean, you know, many of the kind of foundational thinking isn't, isn't radical innovations from what was being done in the 1950s, which are very white male spaces. You know, I'm particularly struck because like, it's about a, about a hand reach, but uh, you know, this book I've been talking about for 1947, uh, 19, yeah, 1947, An Economic Theory of Democracy by Anthony Downs, probably one of the most cited books in the social sciences. It's basically, you know, an economist talking about what is a universal agent. And that universal agent is so historically specific that it, but yet it's been totally reified. And, and that I think also, you know, has these kind of tremendous policy implications because we look at what discourses and language are privileged in the policy discussions. It's the law, it's economic thinking, you know, the variability of our scholarship to make an intervention in these spaces um, is marginalized by the same techniques that I think are perpetuating very, very problematic iterations of things like auto optimization and, and, or, and, and, and are leaving, I think, what Arit's talking about is the commensurability of, of say an optimization project with something more like a more critical uh, reimagining what computing could be. Are they commensurate or not? And th those are, those I think aren't in, in, the, in a policy space. And I know that that's a difficult place for it to be, but I think that that's kind of crucial if you are committed to say, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a, you know, social democratic order. Well, I mean, also all of the, as to Fenway, to, to pick up what you just said, uh, I mean, because the so, social sciences uh, post-World War II were deeply quantified, economics being, of course, economics was earlier quantified, but it's real uh, uh, um, optimization, um, uh, uh, you know, um, success was during, during the second, post-Second World War. Um, and for, for years, economists, uh, together with the lawyers, I mean, uh, law and economics was a perfect thing of like basically quantifying anything that had to do with policy or legal structures. Uh, and you find like the public choice models coming out of, you know, people like Buchanan and that, that those models basically, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I <laughs> Those models, um, you know, have have basically taken over political thought, you know, and, and action in the United States, this idea that, first of all, you can uh, essentially uh, treat uh, any politician as simply self-interest agent. So therefore, there is no hope uh, whatsoever in basically having any kind of political change, because you're, the agents who are designed, the representatives who are basically there are supposed to, to be... Um, uh, you know, the representatives of the people are basically in it for themselves. And so, you know, by, by, so these, these, it's, it's no wonder, of course, these are the problems, you know, it's no wonder that, that, that the same debate comes now in, in AI policy, you know, because it's still the same kind of quantified argument. Yeah, I just want to jump, I just want to jump in on that public choice comment, just for Bart to, uh, to, to, to screw with him a bit, because, uh, so this is the game Democracy from 1966, nice. designed by James. <laughs> Which is designed by James Coleman. James Coleman. Ah, oh, shit! Really? Oh, famous, nice find. Yeah. The famous quantitative sociologist who was a member of the Public Choice Society. So it's like wow. very. You can look very directly at the ways that some of the first educational games were agents designed to publicize public choice theory. And so oh, it's the legislative know. process, right? The working of the legislative process, that's the workings of the demos. We're going to play yeah. that game. We're going to play that no, game. I, I, <laughs> it's it's not redistrict yet. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be gerrymandered for now. <laughs> it's it, it, uh, they, they found that people didn't learn as much from the game as they were hoping. But I mean, you know, they, but it's, I think it's just so overwhelming how much this and like the history of datification right you know just the investment in that you know you're talking about 60 year history that allows for something like machine learning to be even be possible right and like and that i mean in the united states it's all through arpa funding and cia funding to a you know to a lesser degree and i mean that's i think part of that critical history where it, it, you know it, it very directly you know impacts yeah how do we understand something like the politics Although I'd like to just yeah, interject ahead. for one second. While, I, <laughs> while I'm a huge proponent of these histories, I also want to suggest that 
we also need to worry about the inevitability that most of our critique assumes that the systems we have today are inevitable and the only choice. And I'm also interested conversely at trying to understand what we could learn. Actually, like, what can we learn from neoliberal? Like not in a, or maybe nothing, but when you're actually looking pretty closely, these things like, like I, when I'm looking at environmental management systems or supply chain or stuff like this, uh, people are constantly running and also in democracy, when you're looking through many of the top political thinkers applying cybernetics, I don't know, I've, I've done a lot of work on Carl Deutsch and some of these other figures. Um, you're always seeing this problem where people, there are tensions that people already diagnose and I'm kind of wondering about activating them. Like everybody has this idea of public choice and, and, and optimization, but they're constantly dealing with this other problem of machine learning, which is learning. And, and change. And it actually people don't want systems to, like on one hand, there's a deep need for balance and homeostasis, but especially as we start moving towards the 70s, post-Borism, post-industrialism, and a non-Cold War model, we're seeing those social models reflect themselves in the transformation and organizational systems. Um, and so I'm really interested in also like, like learning from Las Vegas kind of attitude from the design studio. Like, so yeah, this stuff's terrible, but it's got these inbuilt crazy productive tensions that can't be really surmounted. And so it creates all these incredible new computational solutions to kind of cover up the fact that people are constantly trying to understand how systems adapt and learn while yeah. simultaneously trying to create efficiency. And so I'm really interested also, it's sort of like learning from Fisher Black, you know? <laughs> like, but it's also, it's also like a great, the great a moment for ethnography around these things, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, it, it trips, the technology trips all the time. And you got to be there and you got to be watching. Uh, so you, you are learning uh, from neoliberalism in that way because it, it, you know, the best laid plans, the, the, the imagination always exceeds the experience. And it's in, it's in the actual experiences, the hiccups and the trips and the misdirections and the ever where the possibilities lie, I think. So while the historical thing sensitizes us to what to look for, it's kind of like then we have to be in the mix uh, directly, uh, watching, waiting, uh, and and uh, intervening uh, directly, uh, which is uh, which is also why I think the art and AI uh, trajectories are important, um, for sure, for sure. So we're we're heading in on one, and I did say I would throw out the Zoom. There are definitely people waiting to get on. We didn't take up the body. Jean Jean Dubois has a question that that uh, he tossed. Echoing Chris's question about general intelligence out, out, outside a body, can we conversely consider a hyper-specialized intelligence located in a living body as is possible to do in a machine? So do you want to do bodies for a bit and then open it up? I can, uh, I can maybe try to respond, uh, open, the, this, open the, get the first shot at it. Uh, well, I think that both of these, um, um, these um, uh, the question contains these kind of the the these kind of both of these uh, sides of the story, right? The the idea that you could have an artificial intelligence that wouldn't uh, have a body uh, that would be and purely based on software, and like it really comes from this dualistic dichotomy uh, that that you know was sort of like there at the, at the very beginning of um, in the 90s, 50s with the appearance of com computer and the definition of, of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and it, so if you, if, you, if you look at it from that perspective, if you, if you, buy, if you buy the idea that you could have a general, like, so a, a software system that would be able to work with other body, then I think definitely you could, <laughs> if that were true, then yeah, I guess you could have an intelligence, uh, an AI uh, running on in a living body. And the reason for that is that uh, computationalism, which is this idea that, um, that cognition is computing and, and uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the premises of that uh, 
system of uh, theory of mind is that um, you uh, is that the, the hardware is irrelevant. So uh, as long as the functionality is there, so as long as you have this, I uh, remember the Turing test. As long as you have this machine where you can, you know, ask questions and it gives you an answer. The the whether there's a body inside the box or whether it's a, a system of gears or whether it's an army of people that uh, you know uh, type things and typewriters and 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 send uh, uh, send things in the mail and then receive some messages and as long as in the end you get your answer back it doesn't matter the hardware doesn't matter but of course I mean this this um, this theory has been, which has been really dominant, has been dominating culture uh, and uh, also cognitive science uh, for uh, for for ages. But it's it's slowly and in in starting in the 1980s and and then increasingly in the 1990s, uh, it started crumbling. And I I think nowadays the uh, it's not anymore uh, the, the the accepted um, theory because in, in even in cognitive science because it it has so much so many uh, problems um, uh, from you know at, at all kinds of different levels. Uh, this being said, I mean I think that uh, 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 it's probably. I mean, we see that with GPT-3 is that like you, you can have this, perhaps these very, very, very advanced uh, simulations of intelligence or these very, uh, these, these machines that, can, that are able to do very specific, that are very good at, at very specific tasks and at maybe, uh, you know, replacing to some extent uh, some of the mental tasks that are usually uh, reserved to human beings. Um, but, but anyway, this is, I'll just, uh, but Sophie, oh, I'm just Chris, you, you should yeah. reply. I've just, what I've done is uh, we're throwing out the Zoom link to folks on YouTube. People, if you have to leave, is no problem. We're, we we know we can keep talking forever, uh, but people will start showing up on Zoom. And what, what I'll do is that people, we can we can start uh, expanding the discussion and, and, you know, you can just let me know you want to chat in, uh, in the chat in Zoom. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, Chris, keep going and we'll- No, I was just, I, I, first, of course, I was just thinking about, you know, Sophie, I'm talking about, you know, little people inside machines. It reminds me of Giuliani's comment that, you know, Hugo Chavez was sending, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> agents inside the voting machines to to change the vote to uh, from Trump to Biden. Um, no, I mean, the, 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 the big, the, one of the big questions with GPT-3, which is interesting, is it, it seems to almost take us back to someone like Chomsky is suddenly saying, OK, well, we can have we can have all the rules of grammar already in the brain. We don't have to worry about any context. We don't have to worry about anything outside um, in the environment. We don't have to worry about anything that cannot basically be within that that within that closed framework. Um, and as we know, generative grammar has been critiqued now for 50 years. Um, and now, once again, the, the same thing comes back is that, well, no, here's the cue to, here's the, here's the clear path to, you know, the beginning of this kind of artificial, you know, simulated form of, of intelligence. And the, the, you know, what happens to all of the arguments I'm thinking about, you know, Lakoff and Johnson's arguments about metaphor, that metaphor, for instance, is deeply, you know, uh, within, for instance, you know, motion movement uh, and embodied, represented in, in the brain and not, and contextual, not simply based on statistical relationships uh, connected to other statistical relationships of which these GPT-3 models work, right? I mean, so, so you know, this is going back to Orit's thing about this epistemological, okay, so now we say that language, for instance, if we take a kind of Shannon model, language is a statistical process, right? So that's a really, a, a quite, you know, a strong position to take is say, you know, we can take language and put it this way. If you take the idea that language is actually not simply a cognitive process, but is deeply rooted in, um, in, in, in the context that one's body is in or bodies are in, then you, you have a problem because you could say, yes, this is a simulation, but it still has massive gaps. Um, if we, if, you know, if, if, if we're, um, 
tending to, to take the view that a human being's capacity with language is something which is not simply rooted in, in cognitive processes only. Um, so, you know, it, it, again, the, the hype machine once again takes us back to arguments which were refuted over the last 50 years. Ah, nice crowd. Nice to see you all. <laughs> so we're wide open now. Who wants to talk about something good? I had uh, something. I, I just uh, had a question I was I would like to throw, uh, which I think re re relates to all of the things I've been we've been uh, discussing. So. Um, the, I was thinking that the because we were talking about optimization earlier and capitalism and neoliberalism, and one thing I was thinking is that uh, it, it's 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 very very recent that we have this you know uh, uh, hype around AI and and the reason is that uh, I mean like AI for for ages was not very lucrative you know and and suddenly with the with you get deep learning, you get GPUs that can do the, the work, and then you have access to so much data. And then suddenly you can make <laughs> money. And this is just like what's driving the whole thing. And also like putting aside maybe all the other approaches to AI. But I, I, I was wondering whether, because like uh, we talked about self-organizations, decision-making, diversity. I mean, like you look at the uh, the 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 Dartmouth uh, conferences, the the sort of the 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 plan to make AI. One of the things was creativity. Also, and so there's a lot of people working on this subject right now. But I'm I'm wondering because I, I I mean you, you contrast what we have today with this uh, you know society of like the, these technologies that are uh, uh, basically con like able to control, to change, to transform uh, human actions, to transform culture and that are implemented to, um, and that, that, that completely changed the, the way politics and economic. Could and we contrast that to the early uh, experiences from the cyberneticians from the 1940s and 50s, like people like Gray Walter and uh, Russ Ashby, who were uh, much more working with these, just exploring these open-ended systems or you look at the artificial uh, life movement in the 1980s. So, so, so I'm just wondering. Uh, so my question is like, do you do you think that, uh, you know, that in this project of AI, uh, that there are maybe the seeds of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, alternatives, uh, alternative responses to uh, to the way that it's implemented? So. So that, that would be my question. Do you think, do you think I like just want, there was something? You, there was something you. Some of the some of the elements are maybe already yeah, there, yeah. It's just that they're not the focus because they're not lucrative. There was something you said though that made me want to redirect. Right, this this is this idea that why, why is it why why is it so successful now? Why is it big now? And I would almost reverse kind of reverse the hypothesis. It's actually society that is becoming more amenable to it. Society's changed. We're becoming more computable, uh, so that the technology is actually appearing to work. Uh, would be my hypothesis, right? That 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 there are major changes, and if it's not just neoliberalism, but fine, let's let's use it. <laughs> uh, which is which is are orchestrating transformations in the social fabric that makes it amenable to certain kinds of technologies rather than others. And we could begin to explore that by looking at the pockets where that's just not possible, right? So, so you 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 would say where where is actually the technology failing, and these would give us clues to the amenability or not uh, of <laughs> subjects subjects. To, uh, so so the the amenability or not of uh, of the production of knowledge off of the off of this technology, right? Um, so, so it's weird because I, I, I think in a way, uh, and this is where AI is different from other kinds of technologies to me, is that uh, at least for a certain class of knowledge, uh, human 
activity and human behavior is implicated in the production of knowledge itself. You, you know, you could have an AI system that is scanning the planets and the stars and is generating uh, hypotheses about the relationship between planetary bodies. And that's very different than uh, uh, relying on uh, data in human subjects to generate knowledge about those subjects. Um, and these are two different classes. Um, both, by the way, are connected to questions about optimization, but this was why I was talking about the difference between good optimization and, and, um, and, and maybe not good optimization or something along those lines. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why I think this, you know, ultimately this is a, a social technology um, and it's social sciences that that <laughs> should be involved in the production of AI uh, more than engineering. <laughs> so just, well, just one thing to flag is that before the pandemic and all the end times started, um, you know, one of the things we've been talking about with Luke Stark was was trying to get together a, to do a workshop on algorithmic impact assessments. And I know I've kind of jabbered on about that before, but I do think that, you know, and sometimes it's like, what is some tangible objecty type thing that can, can that can demonstrate, you know, the 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 perspective gained. And I don't and I don't love this algorithm. You know, I don't love the instrumental nature of algorithmic impact assessments, but I like that word as a, that phrase as a space of imagination. Um, and so just, you know, one thing to always think, you know, down the road for this group is thinking about how we can actually, you know, do something and play around with that. Um, you know, ideally in times where we could actually also go for a coffee after, you know. All right, Jonathan, Jason, Len, you come yeah, on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> having trouble moving from, from Zoom, not Zoom, from YouTube to Zoom, but I guess. I know, YouTube's kind of crappy, eh? <laughs> I was like on, on both sides, which was like, giving me feedbacks so it was weird um can i jump in because yeah i've been listening for an hour looking at the ceiling of my office and and there were a lot to chew but and i love the discussion thank you um among the topic i kind of wanted to circle back to <laughs> you talked about that's so topic. dramatic <laughs> Well, it is. It is about culture, <laughs> and, and, and surprisingly, it's not. It's not only. It's not the first meeting on uh, AI culture this week, actually, because there were this this almost famous talk by Benjo and Kate Crawford this week that they were attempting at defining what is an AI culture, and it was a huge flop because Benjo and and in, in kind of incarcerate uh, Crawford into this definition of culture as just being their own culture of publishing stuff within computer science. So basically they were just talking about the managerial culture of AI within computer science, how they get the money, you know, like really a narrow, narrow definition of culture. And listening to you guys, I thought, well, that might be the bottom line here that the biggest problem of all is that these guys they want to talk about politics they want to talk about ethics but in the first place they don't have any notion of what culture is and from that problem it just go down the drain altogether and so they try to create stuff about ethics and 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 accountability fairness blah 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 but they don't have a, a sense of how rich human communication can be and from that point on, it's just, it's pure bullshit. So basically that was one first point. The other point is if you want to define what culture is, then you, you face some sort of, of theoretical hurdle, which are the, the discussion with algorithmic culture from the early 2000, uh, what you have now. And it always kind of go to the point where, as uh, Sofiane said, it's, it's so ambiguous that you cannot have like one definition of it. And so that is kind of the, 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 the end game here is like, you don't want to have, not have a narrow definition, but you cannot, on the other side, you cannot have like this super broad definition of what culture is and what AI culture is. And so this is where we kind of, we're kind of stuck. But at the same time, I'm, I was looking at my ceiling and like, well, 
this is the place for social sciences. You know, like, like this kind of mezzo level where we're, or as Bart said, we're going for ethnographic studies and we're looking at closer range problem. This is where we stand and that's kind of okay place actually. So like not too broad, not too narrow, but uh, don't go back to, to Benjo definition of culture that it was horrible. Yes. Lynn, Lynn, yeah. So I, I just wanted to ask for whether you could uh, clarify for me something about spaces of imagination. So um, I, one of the things I find very mysterious is why AI and deep learning has garnered um, public engouement, you know, it's just <laughs> taken over the public psyche. Uh, yes, I mean, it's Montreal a bit, it's, there's lots of history there, there's money, opportunities for money, but why are people so little excited and talking about something like CRISPR? It's not that it doesn't exist in the public discourse, but comparatively, you know, given how powerful it is and what's, you know, what it means, uh, comparatively, there's very little discussion about it. So like, I mean, I, I've come down to wondering whether some of it isn't just because, you know, the, the, the phrase or the words deep learning and artificial intelligence are sexy and kind of metaphoric and apprehendable uh, or, and CRISPR is like a meaningless technical sounding thing is a bit, how can it be that? Why is there such a gap between the two, uh, you know, the, the, the public discourse? Can I say something to that? When I, I actually think it's it's really important to be situated uh, culturally because I'm in Boston right now, which is the center of biotech world. And like everyone's here, BioNTech's down the street, like their American offices, Novartis, which there's like a building boom, like you would not believe. I walk by companies called CRISPR Technologies and like that's all anyone's talking about. For sure. So, so I think that that's also like that's interesting because I'm totally supporting you. Like, I think there's something really fascinating about uh, the particular. Well, it's, it does feel um, right at this minute it that it's situated, but I would agree that there's also a real hype. And one of the things that really interests me when I came into grad school, I was going to do the integration of information and biotechnology looking at genomics. So I started in genomics research and ethnography. And I've seen these two technologies go back and forth and for me and sort of in terms of like the capture around first the gene genome project and that was going to be everything. And then everybody moved to AI. And, and so I'm interested epistemologically, one, if we can think more together with these things, like not so much like AI versus CRISPR, but both of them as questions of how we've transformed the idea of media and the manipulation of life through technical means, both at the biological and the supposedly calculative level, because the interface between the two is massive. And, and sometimes massive also in terms of platforms and stuff. Um, but I also agree with you that um, there's a really interesting question that's opens both politically and, and in terms of path dependency, since we're talking a lot about like, especially in Canada where there's much heavier government spending and stuff like that about sort of where, where things are getting focused. Um, so I don't have a set, um, like answer to that, but I would say that um, it's it might be really vital to think about the two and also what each of them is hiding over the other, particularly at a moment of extreme conservatism actually around things like reproductive rights, uh, at least here in the United States and other places, which kind of stamp all these technologies kind of run into those um, stabilities, right, around um, race and sex. So I don't know, it's something I've been actually thinking a lot about maybe with you uh, as I've been here in a totally different environment for the last few months where biotechnology is the only game in town and um, and the discourse has been solidly focused on Moderna, on uh, these new technologies. Um, 
and uh, and wondering about whether that's a change, whether the two are related, or whether the kind of focus on one thing or the other occludes or um, blinds us to actually some of the structural changes or some of the um, possibilities also, speaking of imagination, that might be inherent, like that one of the reasons like maybe no one wants to talk directly about biotech is maybe because of religious or sexual conservatism, you know, like that there's, there's actually like a politics at work here about when technologies are getting introduced and not and when they're gaining visibility around which orders they're shoring. So I don't know, I've, I just wanted to say I, a little bit. I, I, I would just jump in on this and say, you know, cause uh, you know, hype alone, I don't think can account for these things. It's just the fact that a lot of people talk about it. Uh, I think there's a level to, I mean, I guess it's slightly a Latourian kind of position. There's a level of performativity that's going on around AI and machine learning that I don't think is present in biotech, or it's certainly not made visible, or rhetorically it hasn't been linked. Uh, the performative aspects haven't been linked properly in a, in, in a, in a kind of uh, sort of marketing sort of way. Uh, but, it, but it's more than just talk, right? So there's talk plus things in the world that uh, seem to be doing something. Uh, and whether that's sort of economic interests that gather around that or political ones or uh, social democratic ones or whatever, there's a lot of mobilization around performance, not around just talk. Um, and in, in the case of CRISPR, uh, it could be very well because a lot of it is uh, definitely privatized and uh, deals going down that are meant to not be public. Um, that, 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 that can't happen in the same way. Uh, although I agree with, with Orit, like the interface there is absolutely critical um, for sure. Well, I mean, I, I would just say, uh, just to pick up Orit's point is that like being in Germany right now, no one's talking about AI. What are they talking about? They're talking about biotech because you know the Germans are gonna save the world. So it's a national, it's a new national project for the Germans, you know? I mean, okay, Pfizer's the, over in the US, you know, but in Germany it says Pfizer doesn't exist. So it, it's very interesting that if any if anything comes out of the pandemic is to show that the climate, the you know machines, uh, and the biological are all so deeply intertwined with one another and impacting each other that um, you know you can't just say well this technology is better than that. I mean, of course, yes. In the 1990s, there were tons of biotech companies. All those startups failed. You know, some people made money, but that kind of went out the window. And then suddenly, yes, now we have this kind of computational model. But at every every um, uh, uh, computer science who who kind of has a forethought will tell you um, that the, the next the next big thing is the integration of information and biological technologies. I mean, which, which is again, a long historical project, right? Going back again to the, um, to the 19 post-war period, of course, but earlier, um, but, but clearly, you know, cybernetics was, was, was so tied to bio, the biological, right? So all of those models are, so I don't, I don't, I don't think, um, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's really contextual, like where, where you are and, and, uh, and Montreal doesn't have big biotech industries, right? So of course- I better do this right. I had, Jonathan, you were sort of like wanting to jump in and then Fen. Yep. Uh, we can go Fen and myself after Fen because he has a tie. <laughs> it's true. <Yeah. laughs> Damn. Look, I gotta, you know, I gotta do something here. If it's showing up with a tie, at least, you know, that's that's my contribution. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I also, you know, Lynn, I think that's a great point. I mean, to me, it's also, I think, interesting looking at how uh, AI was so central to the COVID-19 response, you know, and it's interesting you know, in Canada, that was that was this huge debate. You know, it's like it seems like a million years ago. But all this idea that we're going to have this contact tracing app, and there's going to be an artificial intelligence, and you know, it it is it, a lot of malarkey. But uh, at the same time, I you know that I think is part of what we need to unpack. And like, how do you think about? And I don't love this idea of kind of national geographies, but there is something about what are this kind of particular configuration of Canada, for lack of a better word. Um, that that has legitimated AI as something so central. And I think that that's part of at least being a situated scholar here that draws me to it. I mean, you know, I'm interested in AI partly because of research, but partially because I just am witnessing so much investment and it's partially reactive. But I think that that's, that's part of the, that, that's the, 
you know, that's part of our stakes here. Yeah, so following on, on this IBE question, uh, I, I would go with Bart. There's something Latourian about this, which is there's discourse, but there's IBE discourse, but there's IBE transform or translated in, in, in real hard cash. And the, the, it, I'm saying that because we were studying the, uh, the, the IBE in Montreal in the, in the early 2015, 16 and stuff like that. And it was really funny to see how the researcher were talking about the biggest deep learning community and it got picked up by the Ministry of, of Development, um, uh, on Glad, who was, she was saying, it's the biggest artificial intelligence community, which of course it's not true when you compare to Pittsburgh, Boston, and place like that. But all of these, these bad translation were picked on by politicians who give public money, and they were translated again and again by media, by the media sphere. And all of these things is what, you know, account for this hype. And when you, take these, all of these small mistakes and all of these small communication, you break them apart, you realize that the I stands on much, not much stuff. But again, as a social construct is amazing because it's, it's so full of energy and craziness because people were not talking about the same thing in the first place. But they got entangled in these kind of I slash moving forward slash discourse and over discourse and stuff like that. To the point, actually, to go to Fan's point, where Benjo was all over the place, all the way to creating his own app for COVID-19. And when he got crushed by the government, it kind of created a shift in paradigm that we have with no clue what's going to follow up now. But it's really interesting time because we're kind of probably seeing that this hype cycle is not ending now but it's at a turning point to at least and i'm thinking that the covid will be a different it will be some sort of game changer for the for the toronto slash uh, montreal corridor because they were on sex uh, unsuccessful in having their way see and i'll disagree just to to, to quickly jump in like uh it's it's too two social constructivists of you uh there's 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 things there there's autonomous machines uh and not because they're autonomous but because they are warranted as being autonomous there are there are uh algorithms performing independently of anything Benjo says uh and so it's not Benjo's word anymore that everybody relies on but it's about the performance of these algorithms and and the, the rhetoric there is linking the performance of those algorithms to a particular politics, to a particular hype cycle. But that's a trick, you know, that's that. But they couldn't do it without the things, without the performances. Uh, so the fact that, uh, and I would say something like CRISPR is still too tied to people. It's still too tied to these, to, in a classical social constructivist way. It doesn't, it can't perform autonomously in the way that certain algorithms can perform. Uh, algorithms make news, not people now. So uh, in, pe in fact, people don't even know the people anymore behind them. Uh, they, they, they are being warranted as standing on their own, which is part of the, I think, the particular power here. And I actually don't think it's going to go away. The hype cycles will shift. Uh, but I actually think now uh, there's a certain amount of, if you like, systems that have been set in motion uh, that can function on their own steam. Um, that, that need to be kind of pressed and accounted for. And it's not just about anymore deconstructing the hype, challenging the hype, uh, showing the political interest. In this classical sociology of science sense, that's what we used to do. Like, what are their interests? You know, what is motivating them? Where is the money? And so on and so forth. Now we're beyond that. Uh, there's other things happening. Sorry, mm -hmm. or you want to jump in. You're, oh, or is left, right. <laughs> Fen? I was just saying bye to Ori. Oh, wave. that's nice. Bye bye. Or... All right, more. Uh, can you can you clarify what you mean by functioning on their own steam? Uh, in, in this in the sense that uh, they don't need uh, individuals to speak for them. Uh, you don't need uh, an expert so much to tell you what's happening. Um, that that um, the. And this is part of the visual rhetoric uh, of machine learning, even when it comes to like uh, facial recognition or something like that. Whether it's right or wrong, 
uh, facial recognition algorithms perform. And they, they don't, you don't need somebody by saying, well, let me tell you what's happening. Right? Oh, it's, it's doing this, that, or the other thing. And that's that, that's uh, when it's science in the making, when it's knowledge in the making, that, that, that entanglement is really, really, uh, but as soon as uh, you get to an instrument or a tool or technology, which can produce or perform in the world independently of a human's mediation, of its of that performance, uh, then you, then you're talking about a scale change, a shift, uh, at least the way what we study. What is studies. That you want us to, to, to choose one or the other? I mean, no, do... they're always they're always there, but 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 we're talking about a, a if we're comparing, for instance, CRISPR with uh, facial recognition. This is one of the ways I would account for that difference. CRISPR still but... needs a spokesperson. Facial recognition but... doesn't. But I, I would just go, I mean, or it's left, but I mean, I, I would always kind of try to trace back a bit and say, um, okay, for instance, the COVID apps, they haven't been picked up anywhere, you know, uh, except I actually have to download one next week because I'm going somewhere. So I have to, where I'm going, I need it. But they haven't been picked up anywhere. The, the bigger question is, um, you know, a more fundamental one, which is like, yes, those apps failed, but not the vision of a human that those apps have, which is, you know, running Bayesian networks and basically trying to create these predictable models of humans, right? So that's not going to go away. That is here to stay and it's going to keep getting more and more. It's going to be in your toaster in two years, you know? So, so the, this, this, these, we tend to get seduced by the, the, the technology, the technologies will come and go as we know, right? And they're predominantly path dependent anyway. So the, the, the more important thing is, is like, why, why are those models still sticking around? Or why, what do these models offer beside certain, under, certain advances of knowledge for in computer science? What do those models offer um, uh, that they, they, you know, that they hadn't had in, in, in the past? Or what kind of vision uh, do those models produce of humans um, that, you know, and this goes back to questions about not only optimization and resilience, but but also even like, well, okay, uh, are we are we speculating in the technology? Uh, I know I'm just not saying in a creative way, but are we speculating that this is the kind of human we want to produce by these by these um, by having people adopt these tools and then becoming part of that kind of deeply entangled structure? Uh, or are we proposing another way of thinking about humans? I mean, the, you know, if we can solve everything by one kind of technology. Uh, that assumes we have a very particular understanding of what human beings are, because all these technologies have deep forms of interaction built into them as, as models. So I'm, I, I, I always get worried about too much like, oh, that didn't work, therefore we're going to go on to something else. I, I don't think so, but I think it's, it, but it's a much, much longer trajectory. That uh, but I'm worried that's too general. That's too general and too ideological, ideologically focused, as opposed to saying, Okay, uh, machine learning, where does it work? Supply chain management in the Amazon warehouse. That's where it's really working. Yeah, that's where it's working. It, and how is that different from, uh, you know, machine learning used to write uh, lyrics for a song? Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, it's too much to say, oh, well, both of those things are about a general model of, of the human um, at one level. At the other level, we need to say, okay, what is, what is, what is this algorithm or machine, however you want to, whatever degree of embodiment you want to give it, how is it performing in the world and what are the consequences of its performance, right? Sometimes the performance is really weak. So the songwriting machine learning is pretty weak. And if you look at the, how that appears in the media, there's always spokespeople for it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you got to have a songwriter say, yeah, that machine, that algorithm, that made a really, that was a creative algorithm, right? It can't speak for itself. It can't produce art by itself. It has to have somebody else say, yeah, that's art. No, that's not art. Um, and there's always somebody in the background, like doing that, the work that, that would, but you don't have to do that for the uh, supply chain management algorithm. It, it's acting on its own. Uh, in that sense, right? So there's really very palpable material differences in the way these things hit the ground. Even if at the at the, all the way in the back, we want to talk about the culture of optimization, which leads us to have to worry about these systems, all of these systems, right? 
Um, yeah. Yeah, the interesting thing about if you just that the AI show, uh, what Sophie and can also say it, the response of the critics was I say all this, you know, it's these these machines can't really make art, as if, <laughs> as if anyone who was working with those systems assumed that they were going to make art or create, you know. So there's a projection. Say, well, this is about a projection on what we think these things do versus what they actually, what the work they actually do. Kind of the yeah, same I, I, saying a camera can make art, right? Yeah, it was a bad it was a bad example because actually nobody could make art at all. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's an interesting thing that there's an interesting thing. That, Sorry, uh, there's an interesting thing that Andreas Brockman in an article he wrote about kind of machine, uh, you know, machine intelligence and trying to critique this fetishism with the machine. He said, even the question of like creation or uh, uh, with a machine and especially artistic creation is absolutely a, a, a irrelevant question because his, says, his argument was artistic practice is a social process already. It involves humans, it involves audiences. So therefore human, you know, the machine has, is not social in that way, you know? So therefore that's an irrelevant question, you know? Um, but people get caught up on it. Oh, is this, you know, this thing that's being sold at Christie's, is that, you know, is that, you know, is the machine gonna, you know, trump the human? And make, that, that's, not the, that's not the interesting question, but everyone, but the hype, People get stuck in that question, just the same as they get stuck in the question in terms of artistic work with biological systems. Oh, well, that's ethically wrong. It's like, well, the tissue culture is done in every major uh, hospital and uh, you know research facility around the world. No one says a thing about that, but that's for the good of humans because we're developing new, you know, new industries and new jobs and new technologies. But the minute you place it into a cultural context, well, so that's ethically wrong. You know, so it's 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 the same thing. That becomes the red herring for for other more important questions that get sidetracked by that same old, you know, by that same question. Can a, very, a, can a machine create? That was a very old common mistake. I mean, the idea that you would mistake technical, some, something that is skill-based or technical for something that's artistic or that you would mistake the perception of an, an audience that something has been, you know, is good or has been made by a person for, you know, a much, broader social cultural context it goes way back it's not just AI. yeah yeah but it keeps getting again these stories keep getting repeated again and again and again you know in the in the so-called public imagination yeah but at the same time i mean uh, if it's can't it be argued that uh, so 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 for example uh, you know there's uh, more and more uh, ais that are uh, Possibly uh, composing uh, texts that you you don't know they're made by AIs. I mean, or or songs is a good, good example. You 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 log into Spotify and and then you 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 have a mix of songs and then maybe you don't notice that and and you you, you listen to a song and and it's great. You love it and actually it was made by an AI. So how is that uh, not part of this? Uh, social or cultural um, uh, system that you're describing, you know, like that, that's what I meant. That is, that is seeing it from an audience point of view, from a, from the, the 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 audience side. That you may well see something and think that it was made by yeah, yeah, okay, uh, okay. And that, yeah, and that and that there's, I mean, all kinds of things can be said about that. I think that's actually often great, you know. Mm. I, I uh, but it's. It, you know, we define art as something that has both sides, you know, mm -hmm. but also has the side of being having been made or curated by a human. So it can be curated by a human as art. And it needs, I think for, that it needs both sides. So when you've only got one, it's just like a, a half, it's half art. <laughs> Hello. A new topic as we, we, we're 140. We haven't really done bodies. I don't know. Well, we can't come back to, to the, the bodies. And I think I, I don't remember exactly, but we're at some point we were talking, we were getting into, okay, well, why, why do people uh, buy into these mythologies, let's say of like, you know, uh, AI being AIs being um, uh, creative and and uh, 
this uh, this idea that uh, yeah like that intelligence is something that uh, can be uh, completely disembodied and that these myths are keep resurfacing right um, and I, isn't it I, I mean I'm just gonna make a you know like a um, a, a very uh, very uh, just throwing this hypothesis like I mean like if you look at uh, the Western culture, uh, you look at the US, like what, like what's the percentage of people who believe in God? I mean, like most, most people believe in, in God. So they believe in, uh, this, uh, uh, they believe in, the, 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 they're, 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 they believe in, no, it's true. Like a dual is, it comes that this idea, the separation of, uh, of uh, mind and body is, is just, you know, textbook is it a textbook Judeo-Christian dualism? I mean, isn't it like okay? But uh, but but all right, let, let's push that up. And, so but I mean, again, like, uh, people. I want to I want to separate the ideological, like the belief, from the performance. So I read Chris's question as about whether uh, a disembodied attempt at general artificial intelligence can perform successfully. I have no no doubt that people will believe it's intelligent, uh, that, that, that there's a, there may is a predisposition, a cultural predisposition to understanding intelligence in terms of these Cartesian dualisms and so on and so forth. That's still quite present and there's lots of cultural kind but of precedent. I, I, it's, just, it's just because we were, at, uh, Chris earlier asked the question, okay, why, why do we see this resurfacing? And I'm also mesmerized by that. I'm, I, I, I'm not super interested actually so much <laughs> <laughs> and these deep learning machines that can, you know, generate text by, you know, consuming like, I don't know, like as much energy as one person consumes in a week, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's fine. Like, well, I, I'm not, I'm much more interested in the, uh, embodied uh, systems, robotic systems, small data approaches, uh, but it seems that people are, yeah, they keep coming back to it. And even if like at this point, like all, like even the cognitive scientists are like, no, actually this doesn't work. Uh, the culture is still ready to, you know, watch even more uh, movies about uh, female AI who are, uh, you know, uh, living on the network or, or male AI who are killing everybody. <laughs> so they're just people buy into these, these, these myths. So I think the hype is attribute, largely attributable to that and to the, also to the effort of the industry to use, to use that. I remember it's funny when Deep Dream came, <laughs> came up and what was it in the early 2010s, uh, one of uh, one of my Facebook friends who is uh, was uh, used to work with Benjo back in the days is now like in, in, set in Paris, and he he, po he made a post. I thought that was really 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 nice. He said, "Oh, finally we have some things." So so the good thing about Deep Dream is that now instead of seeing images of the Terminator when the press talks about AI, now we see like cool images of like psychedelic you know, <laughs> images from, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Central Park. <laughs> so, uh, but I think this is it. And I mean, like, even, I mean, it's fascinating. I just learned that even the Mila has an AI for good branch. So, you know, all of these companies have, I mean, it's not a company, but it's like all of the companies have an AI for good branch, including the Mila, which is a research lab. And I'm like, if you have a branch that's called AI for good, what does the rest of the lab do, you know? <laughs> Are you doing AI for bad or? <laughs> so so I, I think this is, to me, it's very simple. Like there, there's just like, there's, there's, there's so much, like it's, it's less expensive for these companies to invent Deep Dream and, 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 and do AI for, have an ethical branch than to actually be regulated. Like they don't want to be regulated. So instead they're forging the, um, you know, uh, they're, they're, yeah, they're designing this, uh, this idea about AI that it's like, that it can be for good and that can, can be beautiful. Uh, uh, so, uh, I like, I like Jason, Jason's question in the, in the chat. So if you're, you can speak now, Jason. 
Yes. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, this has been really good, great. To, that's a good. Uh, really great to uh, to lurk and listen to. Um, uh, so yeah, I just I I um, have been invited by CFAR to speak to their meeting in January, um, a closed meeting with all 100 of their CFAR AI fellows. So I'm I'm very curious what this group thinks might be some interesting either topics to put on the table in front of them or questions to ask. Ask them what they worry about with AI. What do you think could go wrong? <laughs> hey, Jason, what's their makeup the fellows? Like I know all their chairs are just computer scientists and that one philosopher from U University of Montreal. Like how, I mean, how much, like, yeah, what's the audience like? I mean, it's pretty hardcore technical. I've 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 talked twice before to just the fellows in a particular section, right? So like twenty to twenty five of them, and you know they're you know they're computer scientists, software engineers, mathematicians. Um, what was very interesting is that uh, you know generally it was sort of a you know it was a polite and engaged sort of response, but it was all the young young folks. So the, the, like, you know, the assistant professors, you know, um, or just turned associate professors who came up and talked to me afterwards um, and were very interested. You know, I don't think that they were, I, I don't think any of them were about, were about to be like, okay, let's figure out how we can implement these indigenous epistemologies. But I do th think that they are very open to, you know, the basic argument that they're working from a very narrow, you know, epistemological kind of box. Um, and that these questions, you know, that you guys have been bringing up about, you know, what is intel, you know, what is what is intelligence after all? What is human after all? You know, are we are we actually doing anything that has anything to do with either one of those, except in a very abstract sense? Um, they seem very open to kind of those kind of kind of conversations, and I've had an ongoing conversations with a couple of them about that. If I, so, if I, had, the, if I had the chance, like I would pick up. Actually, I think Orit said it the best so far in the group. Uh, I would pick up on this uh, optimization mindset. And uh, she said it, she had a comment in the meeting where she was like, the problem is that optimization as a goal conflicts with diversity and inclusion, uh, that these are fundamentally uh, counterproductive, uh, which suits very well kinds of things you've been arguing, Jason, but I, but I would tackle it on the, t on the, on the, on the tech on the technicians own categories like it's their own freaking term yeah uh, so that's that's part of what i've been the last couple of talks i've given yeah so one of them is is talking about the will to abstraction right so how engineers are professionalized to see abstraction kind of as a as an ultimate good um and that you know that causes all kinds of problems with diversity and inclusion and representation and things like that um but also in terms of what I've really started saying is I've been saying you guys are really bad engineers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like yeah. you guys, you guys, you know, I just have a little bit of computer science, you know, I have a basic computer science foundation, but even then as an undergraduate, I was taught that garbage in is garbage out. Right. And so if you're giving shitty data to your algorithms, like you should really be ashamed of yourselves. And also I was taught that I needed to be able to explain the systems that I built so if you're actually putting systems that you cannot explain what's happening inside of them into a public facing mode or into anything that actually affects outside people, you're a shitty engineer, right? So, but I, cause I agree, you know, Bart, it's a part of it is about attacking them, like getting away from the, the kind of the big ethical questions. Cause they just shut down, right? They're like, that's not my job. I'm not trained and it doesn't really matter. Right. So part of from my strategy has been like, okay, I understand enough about this stuff that I can see there's some really bad decisions being made. It's just that there's so much money, right, that they're willing to make them. I think that's so that's such a good approach. Like the idea that optimization conflicts with there's a tension, a really central tension between that and resilience, which is so important now, and increasingly people are thinking about that. And of course, diversity, which in my mind is related to resilience, right? And that that is so central like if they can't be got to th think about that then i you know don't know what to think <laughs> yeah and that's a really good point about resilience lynn right is like that's a, the other thing is like okay you're making incredibly brittle systems yeah. right they they just break as soon as you change a couple 
founding assumptions. But as deeply, as Florida was saying, and Art was saying, it's deeply underlying um, ways of thinking about things. You know, there's, this is like, so it's such a big deal that. I mean, what's interesting, so another part of the conversation, you know, the, part of the analogy I use, I just talk about bridges <laughs> and civil engineers, right? And so how we've developed, you know, we've developed professionalization, education, legal systems that basically reinforce that if you're a civil engineer and you build a bridge, there are certain minimal like specifications that you are required to meet, right? Um, and 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 that's built up a whole ecosystem over a long period of time to reinforce those things. And that's what's really missing. That's one of the things that's really missing around all this stuff is that, um, you know, what I've been going hard on is the professionalization because I'm trying to hit them at their egos, right? Um, you know, it's like, you know, you guys are being bad mentors to these younger, these these people that you're educating, right? That you're professionalizing into the field. You're setting a really poor example um, because you're building systems that are brittle, that are that are that are you know epistemologically narrow that don't actually account for you know just huge swaths of human experience. So what's the deal when uh, when Bengio says uh, no problem because they work, right? That's how he justifies not knowing what's going on, uh, and he's constantly writing that, right? He's like, uh, that's not my New paradigm. That. Yeah. So I I had a chance to say I mean. So I think I told you, Bart, about the, the you know, had brunch with Yo-Yo Ma and Bengio, right? You know, like two years ago. And, uh, you know, and that's one of the things that that we talked about at my end of the table, me and Skawanati and then the the, the head of Wapakoni, Wapakoni Mobile, right? Where we basically were like, that's a really immoral position. <laughs> like, that's a deeply immoral position. And part of the reason why we pushed on that is because he was waxing on about the declaration. Right. To Yo-Yo Ma, right? And so we were like, okay, wait, hold on a second, right? You are trying to give yourself an ethical pass here, right? But you're actually taking really unethical approaches to how you're doing this work. So, I, you know, but he's, you know, he's, he's Benjo. He doesn't listen to anybody. You know, one of the things I like, you know, I, I also think is interesting because I, because, because Josh, Nevis and I have got a special issue coming out in optimization. So I'll, I'll send okay. the, uh, I'll send the introduction uh, for feedback if you want after. But I, I mean, I think that also, if you want to hit them, it's like looking at how poor the COVID-19 contact tracing app has been rolled out for reasons that are like, mm. basically had a bunch of engineers in a lab come up with a future that they expected everybody to buy into and it didn't work. And that for everybody before knew that, like I, you know, there was all kinds of criticism. The fact that everybody ignored that speaks to like a bad design process. I mean, that's why I like the algorithmic impact assessment stuff. Cause I think it's like a way of saying to your point, like how do you build in the legislature, the, you know, the laws, the, the policies to make this good design, the good engineering process. And I think you can really point to the fact that no one picked up an exposure tracing. App. That, but that's not that's they're just going to like say that's not my problem. You know, it's it's not it's not my fault. It doesn't work. It's that we don't have a captured population that does what it's told. But but there's a way. But I think there's a way that you you have like, and I haven't found a way of expressing it yet. But the design process, the kind of lab laboratory life that allowed that app. To develop and friction like that's the that's a that's a store point because it didn't work well, that's the entire history of computing's relationship to humans yeah I'm not, right I'm there in a nutshell i mean it doesn't mean we can't keep bringing it up right, all right, all right, all right. okay right. <laughs> <laughs> i think I, if, if i might jump in here i think that that's probably true and it's a problem and you know they're bad engineers if they if things don't work right but i think also that somebody um evoked the fact that this is uh, at a deeper epistemolo epistemological level, in the sense that since big data, scientists have really been talking, there's been a, a, a fight, right? But there's really an emerging group of scientists and computer scientists who are looking at, looking at patterns in data, so data-led rather than theory-led. And so the whole, this whole idea that we're not anymore gonna try to explain all of those things, we're gonna look at data and we're going to get, we got, if things work and if we can find the patterns in the data, then we don't need to explain them. Explainability is still hanging around and causing problems. 
You know, people <laughs> still want it. The customer wants it. The customer wants explainability, but there's a there's a, a big chunk of people, you know, in computer science and in these companies who don't any longer believe that it's about that. They believe they have to pretend to do it and they have to make people happy, but they don't, they feel that the paradigm has changed and they feel that the whole theory led explainability thing is a bit old fashioned. So, I mean, I think the problem is they're not gonna come out and say that, but it is there, right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. So we're yeah, coming. I mean, we're, it, hold on, we're coming up at two, and I know that they're gonna they're gonna shut down the YouTube. So nice I uh, I'll let Chris talk, finish us off, say goodbye to everybody who wants to say goodbye, and and you know if we want to. No, and it, it's interesting with talking with Takashi Akigami, you know, who's building artificial life systems. Uh, we were talking about this issue of big data, and he said, you know, all of this, everyone assumes that meaning can be found from the data, and he says, and this is simply a, a mis a misnomer. You know, um, and, and it, just because you find a pattern doesn't mean the pattern has any meaning. Uh, and this is just, and so you, Benjo can say they work, say, yes, they work within a very specific set of, set of constraints. And once you pull those constraints away, if you, if you don't buy into the model, then, um, then the system doesn't work. You know, uh, so the minute you construct, it's what economists do all the time. They build a model. They say, "Look, it works." But the model doesn't subscribe to actually the reality. That works in the model, but they've left all of the variables out of the model. So they can say, "Yes, why did in two thousand eight? Why did all those models not work?" Well they, well, they work fine. It's like, but they didn't predict what happened in two thousand eight. Because no, but they predicted what the model would want to predict. You know, so this is a huge issue. Like, so you buy into big data, which is also a part of it, a giant you know, uh, it is also part of a kind of driving neoliberal capitalist model of, because it's all those companies, as Sophie will tell you, you know, the, why those models work now is because suddenly there are those companies that collect all that data. They didn't work before all that data, you know, at the scale and the, and the level uh, that, that they, that they're in terms of success, that they work now. So that's the bigger problem. It's like buying into, and scholars also buy into it too. It's like, oh, it's, you know, big data, that's the new space. It's like, well, yes, but that's a, also a very constrained space. So I also have to go. Yeah, that was good. That was good, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. that was fun. Good, good, good to see to you all. See you all. <laughs> yeah. You're missed. Until soon. next time. <laughs> Bye, everyone. In the, in the next virtual <laughs> space. Ciao. 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 Thanks, Hexagram. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>